Okay, I think we, we can um, start here. Um, I just want to welcome you to our session this afternoon on how we plan for climate change adaptation. So um, I'm the chair this morning for this session. My name is Margaret Desmond. I work with the Environmental Protection Agency. And my co-chair um, here is uh, Dr. Tara Schein, who has worked on the um, climate change or the biodiversity um, sectoral adaptation plan. So our objective here today really is to begin to discuss this plan with you today. So we see this interactive session really as a way of actually beginning the real process to the plan itself. So we are going to run through this kind of quickly. Okay, so as I said, we have just got the bear hour. We have a lot to cover. So we will just do the quick introductions. Um, I will give you a very brief overview as to the policy context within which this um, plan was created and why it exists. And then Tara will take you through the, I suppose, the more interesting stuff, really, um, the, the content of the plan, the objectives, and I suppose the key proposed deliverables from the plan. And then we will open up the session to the floor and also to the comments that are coming through from, um, from Slido. So for just the next couple of minutes, I'll just hand you to Tara, and she will tell you what she would hope to do. Can I check something with the organizers? Are we supposed to start this session at 12.15 or 12.30? If we're ahead of ourselves, we can give people another few minutes. 12.15? 12.15 it is? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, thank, so that, I just introduced myself then. I'm, I'm Dr. Tara Shine. I have been working um, supporting Deirdre Lynn and the team in National Parks and Wildlife to put together this sectoral strategy for climate change adaptation for biodiversity. Um, and I'll run you through the process we've gone through so far. And basically today is the start of the public consultation on the draft document we have for you. We have a couple of hard copies, not many, because we're obviously all about saving the trees. Um, but this document is now up online and will be open for consultation until the 17th of April. So at the very end of this, we'll go back to, uh, we'll go back to that, make sure you have the links and the deadlines so that you can all get involved um, continuing on from today. So now, Margaret's going to just run us through the kind of the, the overview from a national level, and then we'll come back into the detail of this plan. So we need Margaret's slides, please. I need, yeah, okay. I'm sure they're going to appear any second. Um, so while my slides are appearing, woohoo, here they are. Um, so basically, as I said, my role is to just kind of, I suppose, tee this up as to why this plan actually exists. So climate policy, I suppose, in the whole context of environmental policy is one of the newer areas and there, I suppose, it's, it's an evolving, a very fast and evolving um, piece of um, environmental policy. Um, Ireland, as, of course, um, along with other countries, is working towards developing its policy um, on climate change and um, progressing that um, as well. So before we move into the policy thing, I just want to just give you something very briefly on the, the two types or the two approaches that are within climate policy itself. And you probably are aware of some of the terminology. So on the one hand, we have what's described as, as mitigation, and that is where we are basically creating actions to reduce our emissions and the ultimate aim there really is to reduce or to contain climate change. The other side or the flip side of that is actually climate change adaptation and that is where we develop actions that will actually allow us to manage the current and expected impacts of climate change. Collectively both of these sides are really how we deal with the consequences of climate change. This plan falls very firmly within the second part of that, within that adaptation remit under climate change. So that's where it falls within uh, climate policy. So where are we internationally or where are we nationally? As I mentioned, there's a lot of climate policy at the international level and at the EU level, and it is evolving at a really quick pace. So you're probably familiar with the Paris Agreement being the most recent and I suppose the most hard hitting of the international policy. I suppose from an adaptation perspective, it was really significant in that it was the first of these big international policies that brought adaptation up to the same level as mitigation. So heretofore, mitigation had been the main focus, I think, of international policy on climate, but with Paris, um, adaptation started to find an equal, um, I suppose, status. So what have we been doing nationally? So I'm going to begin at 2014, and I 
because really that's when the most significant inroads have been made. So in 2014, we had the development of Ireland's uh, national policy perspective on uh, climate action and low carbon, and that set out really um, a broad level uh, perspective or vision as to where climate policy would hopefully go into the future. I suppose the key thrust of that really is that we were heading towards this notion of a low carbon, climate resilient Ireland. That vision has been, I suppose, brought forward, and we see that now in later policy and more current policy, that vision is still coming through, but we're now coming to a space where we need to have that um, made real and implemented, and this strategy that we'll be talking about today is one of the outcomes of that. The next line here, and the second line on my graph here, is actually the Climate Act, the Climate Act in 2015. This was really a very significant piece of legislation from a climate perspective in that it allowed a certain amount of things to happen, and of course, it gave them a statutory basis. So from our perspective, the kind of three key interesting things are here. It set up the basis for the Climate Change Advisory Council. It also set up the basis for the National Mitigation Plan. And it set up the basis for the National Adaptation Strategy, and out of that, then subsequently, have fallen these uh, sectoral strategies, which we will discuss today. So, as I said, we've had two important pieces of uh, policy have come out of that piece of legislation, the National Mitigation Plan in 2017, and in 2018, January, we had the National Adaptation Framework. So that framework has given flesh to the whole vision that was set out in 2014, and the key objectives there really were that there should be a sectoral approach taken to um, climate change adaptation, that a certain amount of government sectors would be required to develop strategies, and that there were timelines set on this, and that there were also designated responsibilities within this. The strategy has also given a role to local authorities to implement adaptation strategies as well. So I suppose since then, the more significant occurrences have been project uh, in 2018, Project Ireland 2040, and more recently, we've had the implementation plan for the Sustainable Development Goals, which have a clear link through Goal 13 in particular, right back to climate change. So that's the genesis of where this actual strategy has come out of, and the main one here being the um, adaptation framework in January 2018. So the other thing that I've just been asked to look at here is where this plan fits within the whole gamut of other sectoral plans that are required under the Act and under the National um, Adaptation Framework. As you can see here, and, and to count through them very quickly, there are 12 different sectoral plans required under the framework, and they are under the responsibility of different government, part, uh, different government um, departments, as you can see. The timeline on these is that they're being written right now by different government uh, departments, and there's a lot of consultation and activity going on there. And the timeline for delivery is expected to be the, 70, or the 30th of September in, in this year. So this plan is one of the first that has actually reached to consultation, which I have to say congratulations to the department and particularly to Dr. Deirdre Lynn for getting it over the line, to getting it to this stage. Um, it's a job well done. Um, I suppose the two things I just want you to, to look at and just think about before I hand over to Tara is, if you think about um, biodiversity, biodiversity actually is a crop cross-cutting topic, and if you look at the breakdown of the different plans that will be coming through here, I would suggest that there are none of these plans that can't but consider biodiversity. So biodiversity has an inroad, one way or another, to each of these other plans. So this requires, and Tara will address this, the cross-sectoral approach that biodiversity itself has been taking, where there's a realisation that there's a need to reach out to other stakeholders, that responsibility for biodiversity doesn't um, isn't in the I sort of beholden to one government department alone to actually take action. It actually spreads across a number of different areas. The other interesting thing here, I think, is that biodiversity in itself is also an adaptation option. It is something that some of these other sectors will be looking to as an option on how they actually deliver their plans. So that gives it a very interesting I suppose, take on how we understand biodiversity. It's cross-sectoral, but it also is actually a solution to how we deal with climate change as we progress with these plans. So that's as much as I have to say, and the key two, two key home, I suppose, messages were cross-sectoral and adaptation is, our um, biodiversity is an adaptation option in itself. I'll now hand you over to Tara, who will start going through basically the content of the plan and how you can help with the consultation. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, very much. Um, so, welcome. We're hoping this is going to be a very interactive session. There are only two of us speaking. I'm not going to speak for too long. What I want to just do is bring you up to speed on where, how we got to where we are today at the start of the public consultation on the draft adaptation strategy for the biodiversity sector, in inverted commas, um, and to do in so much as we can then today to, to learn from you and get suggestions from you around the adaptation actions that we would like to prioritize and include in this plan. Um, so just where, how did we get to where we are today? So back in 2017, Dr. Deirdre Lynn and, and a small core team in National Parks and Wildlife started to put their minds to what needed to be in a biodiversity adaptation strategy, what information did they already have, what was already in the literature, what did the research commission by the EPA and their department have that could be the baseline. Um, that, that draft was circulated to the National Biodiversity Working Group and the Biodiversity Forum for their feedback. Um, and then in October of last year, we did a stakeholder consultation, bringing together the different government departments and key stakeholders working in biodiversity to help put further, further flesh on the bones of this strategy and to help us to prioritize in particular the kinds of actions and the kind of key messages that we wanted this strategy to, to communicate. Where we are now is that we have the updated version available for public consultation, so we'll come back to that in a minute. It's now up on the National Parks and Wildlife um, Service website, and we will be looking for um, inputs from all of you that are interested. And so today at the National Biodiversity Conference, this is a first chance for us to hear directly from you as the people who are on the ground um, dealing with the conservation of biodiversity and seeing firsthand, most importantly, the impacts that extreme events, climate variability and climate change are having already on our biodiversity. The aim then is that by the, the, by the end of the spring to have um, come around to a final policy, which then hopefully will be submitted to um, the Department of Climate Action by the summer. Um, so thank you for coming and being part of it. So you're one, of, one part of many consultations that have happened already, and this is just the next phase. So this is kind of the people who have been consulted with all, to date. Um, and what I want to do now is run through what the plan contains. Um, and one, one of the first things we did in sort of revamping the first draft was to put this, this plan into the structure. Into, there are now some sectoral guidelines for different government departments around how to put an adaptation strategy together. So we went back and looked at those guidelines and reworked the, the first draft into this new format. So step one is all what they call preparing the ground. And this is where we had to look at the literature. We also had to have a core team, which was established within National Parks and Wildlife, a broader planning theme, which had connections out to the Biodiversity Forum and the working group, look carefully around roles and responsibilities for the development of this strategy, and also to develop a shared understanding of what was the purpose of this document? What would be the keen tone and the messages and the values that would underpin it? So this is covered now in a chapter within the draft and kind of the, the, the first steps preparing the ground. Part two is around climate impact screening. And this sort of involved going back and looking at all the research that's already been done in Ireland on climate and on biodiversity to try and understand the best we could what the current climate change impacts are. We also added an activity in, and this is again guided by the sectoral guidelines, to look at what were the, what were the extreme events, for example, over the ten, last 10 years, and what data did we have on how biodiversity, plus the biodiversity sector as a whole, like the, the workers within it, the people from the NGOs right through to National Parks and Wildlife staff, how were they affected by these extreme events and their ability to perform their functions? So we collected anecdotal evidence of that because we don't actually collect regularly data on how extreme events um, are affecting our biodiversity, nor do we have a long-term monitoring program to follow that. Um, and just maybe to go to this one first, what we, what we have in the literature is some really good information on the impacts of climate change on phenology, so on the, on the timing of our seasons. We have clear evidence of changes in bud burst, for example, from the, the botanical side of things. And I think you know, more and more through citizen science, we're understanding the impact of the shifting seasons, later springs, earlier springs, more variability, um, and the impact that's having on species interactions, on breeding. We know also that there is a change happening in the geographical range and, and species abundance, which is attributed to climate change. 
Obviously, climate change is adding on to the existing pressures that are degrading our habitats and our landscape. So as discussed yesterday in some of the climate change sessions, number one, the biggest threat to climate change remains, and John Carl, who's in the audience, made this point really clearly, is habitat degradation is still the number one issue. Climate change comes in as another layer on top of that and another cause of, of habitat degradation. And then um, in relation to invasive species, changes in, changes in our seasons, changes in temperature, changes in rainfall, also create different conditions that can be favorable or less favorable to invasive species. So that's another key impact that we need to think about. To go back to the other thing that we looked at, which was what did we know about how current extreme events affect biodiversity? This is a sum up of the information we gathered from a, a survey that was sent out to a broad cross section of actors in the field of biodiversity. And um, because we don't have a database on this information, but we know that there is value to um, observations made by people through citizen science. We know there's a value to anecdotal evidence. And what we found from this is that, you know, if you look back just here, even at storm Ophelia and the summer drought and heat wave of 2018, we can see that people have noticed what the impacts were and what the impact was directly on biodiversity and on their ability to do their work. So if you look at Storm Ophelia, there was a high impact on grey seal pups, for example, with an, unprecedented, uh, you know, an unexpected number washing up dead along the shoreline. This was noticed by an MPWS conservation ranger in Wexford. Um, but what we also know about Storm Ophelia is that there was travel restrictions, so staff weren't able to get to their place of work. This all has a knock-on effect on the biodiversity sector as a whole. If you look at the summer heat wave, we know that water levels in Gurley Bog in County Meath were, were lower than normal and that this had a, has an impact uh, on the bog, on the ecosystem. But we also know that in terms of people's ability to carry out their work, that work on a sphagnum transfer trial was badly affected by this prolonged drought. And so that was affecting the work, the investment, the resources, if you like, of the, of the department and the sector as well. So this is something that we'd like to have more information about because what we know is that is what we learn from our ability to deal with one extreme event now in our current climate will help us to understand the actions need, that we need to take to better prepare for and adapt to climate change in the future. So there's a real value in learning from what we're already experiencing in terms of climate change and climate variability. Step three of the, the, the guidelines, the process that you need to go through as a sectoral plan, is to prioritize the key vulnerabilities and climate impacts and to see how those should inform then your climate actions and goals. Again, there isn't quite enough data to draw on to be able to do this prioritization, but luckily we have some studies. I picked out here one example by uh, John Carl and, and Sweeney from 2013. But, you know, we could be quite good, as was mentioned yesterday, to continue some of these studies and, and keep investing in them and keep them going. But we know that some of our most vulnerable habitats are our upland habitats, our peatlands, and our coastal habitats. So even as one way of looking at prioritization, we can look at it like that, for example, on an ecosystem or habitats basis as to where we focus our activity. Obviously, we can't do everything all at once. So like anything else, the same as within the National Biodiversity Action Plan, there is a need to kind of prioritize and give a clear signal to the decision makers of where we want the resources to go to first. The next step um, is incomplete in our study. Um, it is priority impact assessment. Uh, it's incomplete in our study because, because of data constraints, because there hasn't yet been a comprehensive vulnerability assessment of our biodiversity, of our habitats. Um, and because of the complex governance of biodiversity, it's not something that is governed by National Parks and Wildlife Service. It is governed by and looked after by a whole range of government departments. And because of this complex division of responsibilities, um, we simply do not have right now all of the information yet that we need to, to complete this step. And the fifth step is to actually develop the plan. So to develop a goal, objectives, and actions. And this is where we've got to now and where we're going to dig into some of the more detail with you. So a goal has been proposed, which is to protect biodiversity from the impacts of climate change. That's part one. We know that climate change is going to have largely negative impacts, not all, but largely negative impacts on biodiversity. But also to conserve and manage ecosystems, to conserve that biodiversity, so that the biodiversity delivers the services that we need and that ecosystems need to be more resilient to climate change. This point that investment in biodiversity is one of the key strategies we can take both to adapt and to mitigate to climate change. And then we've developed five or proposed five objectives. 
Objective one is around protect and restore biodiversity. Number two, around better understanding and continue to grow our understanding of the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. Number three, to improve landscape connectivity to facilitate mobility in these changing climatic and environmental conditions. Number four is to engage society at large around protecting and biodiversity and understanding its role in increasing our resilience to climate change. And number five, the big whammy, find the money to invest and to make all of this happen. As we heard yesterday, we don't have enough money to implement the National Biodiversity Plan. That would be action number one, implement and fund the Biodiversity Action Plan. That would already be the biggest contribution you could make to this adaptation strategy. So we're going to come back to these objectives in a moment because I want to seek your inputs on each one of them. Uh, but the first thing, just some key considerations that have arisen from the consultations and the conversations we've had today that just, I think are useful to keep in mind as we start to talk about the specific actions that we might want to propose. Um, key thing is, as we've emphasised, but I just can't emphasise it enough, the cross-sectoral linkages. Biodiversity is not a sector. It is part of every aspect of our life. It's part of every economic sector. That means that responsibility for it does not fall neatly into any one government department. Ownership is across government departments, but also across society, across civil society. And that means that it, there are tricky aspects to looking at the roles and responsibilities of those different sectors and to making and capturing the collaborations and linkages that we're going to need to deliver an effective bio, um, adaptation plan for biodiversity. We have in this sector big data and monitoring gaps. We are not collecting enough data regularly on enough species, habitats and ecosystems to be actually able to understand what the current impacts, for example, of extreme events and temperature changes are in our, are in our biodiversity and our wildlife. And that means that we are poorly equipped to be able to plan for a climate affected future. So ongoing monitoring of the impacts of climate change and species and habitats is something that we need a lot more of. And until we have that, we are going to be planning, you know, without the full deck of cards. Key thing is that biodiversity increases resilience. So if we invest in biodiversity, we will be protecting human systems for direct damage. That's a picture of Bull Island, the role it plays in protecting the shorelines of, of, of Dublin from, from storm surge, from sea level rise, cannot be underestimated, as well as being a refuge for biodiversity and some pretty unique biodiversity. So this is around a kind of a, 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 a whole new reason, if you like, for investing in biodiversity, as if we didn't have enough. Um, this whole, yeah, so biodiversity contributes to climate action. Biodiversity is carbon sinks. Biodiversity is mitigation action. Ecosystem restoration increases resilience of those ecosystems and us as human beings. Um, Afforestation of the right kind is, the, is a key thing that we can do to, to balance the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere through our, in, in, through our energy systems, through our industrial systems. Um, and to make sure that we actually could achieve this goal of um, carbon neutrality in the land sector one of these days. And above all, that the existing threats to biodiversity are the same priority for adaptation. So habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation are also the top, top, top issues from an adaptation perspective, just as they are from a biodiversity conservation perspective. Intensive agriculture and a very weird spelling of urbanization um, are, just as challenging, um, are just as challenging in terms of adaptation and managing climate change as they are in terms of general biodiversity um, management and conservation. So it's the, same, it's the same issues. If you like, climate change is just coming in now and adding a whole lot more reasons to invest in biodiversity. And a whole new legal regime, as described by Margaret, that again, is giving more responsibility to government departments and all sectors of society to do their part in conserving our biodiversity. So what we want to do from now on is be interactive and to uh, pick your brains. Um, but I will just give at this moment just even five minutes if anybody wants, needs a question of clarification. I went through what was quite a lot of work from 2017 till now in quite a short amount of time. But that is because we do want to focus largely on interaction and, and learning from you. But if there are questions of clarification or if anything wasn't clear from what Margaret or I said, we can take five minutes just to answer some of those questions now. And there are roving mics. So I have here in the front row and then in the sec third row. Um, and we'll get you a microphone. There's one coming. Thanks for the update. As someone sitting on the outside trying to figure out what's going on in any department of climate change, um, 
it's good to get a bit of clarity, but I'm just wondering and communicating how all this is to happen. You know, I wear a couple of different hats, the uplands, ecotourism, communities, all the rest. We're being asked every day of the week to consult. Yeah. There's probably about 10 or 15 plans out there. If the government could just do a consultation website that we all could just look at everything yeah. and just get it over with, do you know what I mean? Because there's dates that keep chopping and changing and people think they're being done for a reason. Yeah. Basically, do you know what I mean? That's just on that side. And there's a lot of departments missing there. Department of Community and Rural aren't there, the arts aren't there, and tourism isn't there. Now, they're all playing catch up. I know there is some work beginning to happen in tourism, but again, they're all connected. You know, that is my question. Yeah. You know, are they going to get connected in the plans? Are we going to learn, most countries are 15 years ahead of us. In the UK, if you're getting arts funding, you have to do the carbon footprint of the artist, the company, and the customer going to that theatre. You know, there's a lot of work has been done all over the world in terms of best practice. Is that going to be different in every government department climate adaptation plan? Very good question. We'll take another question and we'll try and answer them then together. Yeah. So I suppose um, kind of two questions. Um, one is how do you input into the plan? So I. I um, have a small tree nursery at home in Dublin, so I've actually been looking at the buds, so I'm just wondering how, how I'd actually go about, if I'd managed to collect data from my little tiny tree nursery at home, how would I input that into the plan or input that into the work that you're doing so it could be a source of data, hopefully, for you. Um, and my second question was, you know, Ireland has a horrific uh, track record with climate change and, um, you know, we're, we're sh we've even abolished the Department of the Environment and now the Department of the Environment is submerged into a department that hands out mining licenses and, and it's regularly involved in very destructive um, environmental actions. It, you know, the department now you know, signs over mining leases. And there's no mention of the construction industry and in fact our government is, is very good how on road construction yet again more bypasses. A very good example would be the McCroom bypass which is going through taking out a really critically endangered ecosystem there and now they're planning on relocating the snails. Uh, but they're, you know, um, I just I just find it very disturbing, you know, that we're back, kind of back to where we were 20 years ago. I've been at talks like this since 1999, and it's the same things over and over again. But you know, the country is really going backwards, um, and our rates, our emissions are going through the roof. Um, so I just I suppose there's no accountability for the roads, our over dependence on roads, and okay. the construction industry. And yeah, just it's horrific, really. Okay, so, so two, two, questions. two questions I think you had in there. Okay, so we'll take the, the lady here behind you and then Mar Margaret and I will give whatever answers we can give, recognising that we won't have all the answers. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Tara, you mentioned that... And maybe say your name. It's lovely to know who we're talking to. Uh, I'm Sarah and I work for the Community Foundation for Ireland. Um, you mentioned that one of the key actions that's needed is financial investment in the plan, but I'd just be interested to hear what the scale of that, of the required investment is there. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom and then Margaret, you jump up here and, and, and chime in. This, we don't know the cost, I guess, is the key thing. So but there was some very good conversations yesterday uh, looking at public expenditure review, looking at how we estimate the cost of the investment needed in biodiversity. There's, there is, at the same time, there's plenty of ballpark numbers out there. Um, we need a whole lot more than we have right now and we need it to come from all kinds of, of different sources. Um, so there is some work on putting a cost on that, but there isn't, unless I stand corrected, like a cost for Ireland, for example, what is the cost of implementing the National Biodiversity Action Plan in totality, am I right? I don't think we have a number on that, um, but it certainly needs to be orders of magnitude larger than it is. I think the figure yesterday is that we spend 0.013% or something like that of our um, GDP on biodiversity conservation, so there's clearly room for improvement. Um, how can people input into the plan? Unfortunately, right now, the way to input it into the plan is through the consultation process. I say that, unfortunately, just as I think you figure you're thinking about something much more pro proactive that you can do, but you can certainly start by um, getting, getting engaged with the document online and giving us your suggestions, as you've done here already today. Those are, those are noted. Um, in terms of the position of the, of the government, uh, of the Ministry of Communications, Climate Action and the Environment, that's really not my place to answer, but someone else in the room might want to come back to that. I think the suggestion from the front in terms of there being a one-stop shop for consultation would be really helpful. Um, 
There is one. There you go, Michael, tell us. Sorry, I'll do it again. Sorry. Do that, um, please. It's www.gov.ie forward slash en forward slash consultations forward slash. However, it's not very well populated. But, it, but, it, that, but, the, but the point is, let's make them use it. Yeah. Uh, because actually DCCA is using it, local authorities are using it, but not many others are. Mm. But hopefully that will happen. And yeah. these consultation processes do count. I mean, we, we fought hard for our, our right to participate in all of this. We're, our rights are protected by Principle 10 of the Rio Convention and the Aarhus Convention, so it, it is important to engage. The, the, the law, um, the Climate Act, gives specific um, responsibilities to those government ministries that were listed there. It doesn't mean that the other government departments don't have responsibilities too, but they're the ones that are um, given a specific lead role. So yes, the other government departments do need to get involved. Okay, let's take a couple of other questions and then we're going to jump into the consultation. So John had a question up here and then the gentleman back here behind Sarah. And then Margaret, you can pick up on whatever I've missed there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, John Colman. It's not really a question as such. It was just an add-on thought on the question of cost. Probably if we had a fairly comprehensive vulnerability assessment, then we'd know what adaptation options are, and therefore it would inform likely yeah. costs. Yeah. So just I, a thought, really. So I think that's a priority action in this plan, is undertake a comprehensive vulnerability assessment. Um, great. So the gentleman over here. Great book, uh, UCD. Um, it's great that the plan is uh, referring to the ecosystem service benefits that natural habits cuts can provide in the way of uh, adaptation to climate change and isn't purely focused on, uh, on protection of species, uh, which is evidently extremely important in itself. Uh, but I'm just wondering, I've seen, obviously, you have the list of consultation there, but how much buy-in has there been from other government departments that might have a specific direct connection to climate change adaptations such as the OPW, such as uh, anyone working with water in terms of water quality, uh, protection from storms, the benefits that uh, all those natural habitats provide such as peatlands uh, in terms of climate adaptation. How much input has there been from those government departments, real input? So from the consultations that I've been part of, they've all been there and they've all inputted. I think what's more challenging is deciding where they pick up the responsibility versus uh, National Parks and Wildlife Service, for example. So the engagement is there, yes, um, but I think there's more work to be done on sharing responsibility and being clear on who's responsible for which actions. And that's why within the plan you'll see that the adaptation actions also list the relevant actors and suggestions are welcome as to whether there are actors missing from there as well and that's another way to bring in and, and really highlight the responsibility of a broader cross-section of government departments to delivering on this plan. So that's another area when you're looking at the consultation that you might want to focus in on. I'm going to let Margaret come in and then we're going to start our process because you're still going to get to, to talk and answer your questions. Um, so Margaret, would you add to what you wanted to and then I'll have a look at these questions and see if there's any other answers we can get. Okay, just briefly, I think the, the lady at the front here that mentioned about um, what she perceived to be um, sectors that were not accounted for and that were missing. So I suppose, um, you know, given that I'm not the policy person here, uh, as in write, writing government policy, but I suppose my feeling is that some of your um, fears would be, um, I would hope and expect would be contained within um, some of the sectors that were mentioned at the outset. So if you look at, you mentioned about the community sector and uh, people, basically, well, there is a whole... Um, there's a whole plan to be developed um, under human health. So my mm -hmm. hope and expectation would be that that would include more than physical health itself. It also would be to do with well-being, with the with vulnerability, with vulnerable communities, with uh, communities that you wouldn't possibly normally see. So I think for that whole human health thing, if it's to be done in the way I would expect it would be done, that it would be much wider and it would include. Um, as I said, deprived communities and disparate groups that you know may not be in the normal first protocol, and particularly people that need to be perhaps brought to the table as well, that this is not something they would think of. Um, I can refer you to a piece of research 
that was done by people um, in Galway working under the umbrella of the, the Galway Community Cooperative back uh, maybe 10 years ago. And they took a first step, really, um, and Irwin, you probably know Anne, and her group, they looked at the, the vulnerability of communities and uh, to climate change. And interestingly enough, what they found out was something similar that Tara said earlier on. There are a whole lot of vulnerabilities already out there within particular communities. And what climate change was starting to do was just simply add more pressure to pressures that already existed and I think we're seeing the same thing actually with biodiversity here. Climate change is adding another layer of complexity. You also mentioned about tourism and uh, clearly there isn't um, I suppose a place market there for tourism on its own but I would see that within the uh, section there on the, there's heritage and um, the built heritage in particular I mean the, these are clear resources for the for the tourism industry that it would be expanded out and it would would uh, include those kind of topics so my hope is that when they come up for consultation and um, given that we said the timelines for this would be between now and September you keep an eye out for those and the consultation went open and again you know, I'm throwing it back to you because that's how it has to be, that if those topics that you're particularly interested in aren't there, it's up to you to actually make that intervention. But that's how I would see those kind of more periphery ones um, included. Um, do you want to do some of this? Yeah, just, I looked at some of the slidey questions there while you were talking, Margaret. So, okay. Um, um, yeah, the local authorities one, do you want to take that one? Okay, and I see some local authority people here in the room. And so, so what is the role of the new local authority climate change offices? So under the new governance arrangements for climate change, we now have this new layer of regional offices um, in the country, and they've been established in the past year or so. There are four of them, and they're following a geographic spread linked to climate risk. Um, they are, there's one in the southern seaboard region, and the western seaboard region, the Midlands and the, the Dublin, um, the Dublin metropolitan area. Um, so if you look, take the Dublin metropolitan area, because I can see some people from that particular, they're called, the acronym is CARO, which is Climate Action Regional Offices. So if you look at the Dublin um, CARO, their role right now has been to develop their um, adaptation strategy for the four Dublin authorities, and that strategy is open for consultation right now, and I know they had their big launch in the Mansion House last weekend, and they are now open for consultation with the four local authorities for um, a certain time. So what their role really is that they will develop these at a regional level, adaptation strategies. And the objective here would be that they would set out what the key aims or what the key actions would be for Dublin in this, in this uh, circumstance. And that in time to implement that, that the key actions that are, that are contained within that regional plan will then roll down to each um, local authority and that it will be taken up then within their um, local development plan. So that would be the role for the local authorities, or the CAROs in particular, in the short term. They will give a steer to the local authority that sits beneath them and we would hope and expect to see the objectives that are coming through from the regional level being expressed and implemented at that um, local level. Um, do you want to talk about who's yeah, going to fill the data? Just going to quickly answer the other two and then let's progress on to where uh, hopefully we get to ask the questions and you get to give us the answers. Um, the data gaps, yes, that is, I hope, uh, a series of actions for uh, objective two of this plan. And so I think some of that ca is, is, the is the requirement of government to, to fund and um, to fund the research that we need. But I think there is a really big role in that as well for citizen science. Uh, but it needs to be all part of objective two. So feed in your answers and your suggestions around actions when we get to that. The biodiversity officers and the local authorities, yes, they were all invited, for example, to the stakeholder consultation in October. Very few were able to come. I'm not sure if it was just a bad time for them, but definitely we want to hear from those working on biodiversity at the local level. It is such an important and valuable source of information. And someone else asked about bringing people on board in support of carbon tax. I would say the same thing for support of investment in biodiversity. Um, what I do now is, is run an organization called Change by Degrees, which is all about engaging people to start a conversation around these issues so that we can build the, the political support for, for, more, for more ambitious action. So now, we're going to keep going um, and keep using this Slido um, and use as well our hands and our voices um, in here. So thank you guys for that, for that Slido word, uh, what do you call them? Word doodles, word maps. Um, those are some of the, the key words that you guys were throwing up. If we can go back into my presentation now, we'll go into the, into the questions that I have. So what we want to do now is spend about five to seven minutes on the five different objectives of the, of the adaptation strategy. 
and to collect from you actions to be uh, proposed for inclusion into this plan. So you can either stick up your hand when I, when I ask for your suggestions, or you can send them in via Slido. So for Slido, put Slido into your, into your search engine. When it comes up, click on Slido app, put in biodcon19, the same hashtag as we're using for everything. And that will take you through to this conference. Then click on George's Hall, because that's where we are, and you'll be able to type in your answers there. If you're stuck, ask the person beside you. Um, uh, or stick up your hand, that's the other way you can do it. But this is really useful, because with the Slido responses, we'll be able to record those as part of the out output today. So the first objective that's proposed for the plan is to protect and restore biodiversity to increase resilience. Just to give some ideas of the types of things that are in there, we have an, an action around looking at in particular, um, protecting and restoring hydrological processes, carbon processes, and pollination processes. What do you think of that? We propose an all-Ireland invasive species plan. And we propose um, more action, more integration of payment for ecosystem services through, for example, programs like GLOSS. So you can either give a reaction to those actions or add one. Um, but what you're doing now is direct input into this consultation. It is a direct input into what the final version of this looks like. Um, so I'd love to hear your answers to that just by sticking up your hand, or if you don't want to do that, write it down in Slido. Yeah, so you had your hand. Processes, or is it going to remain as vague as that? Um, it's up to us. So it has, we have had this, if you can imagine in the process so far, this has grown into really big detail where then everything gets lost and it has come back to the more general and it has gone more detailed and it has got more lost. But certainly the more specific we are, the easier it is to assign responsibility, the easier it is to cast the action and therefore the easier it is to make the case for it. So yes, if you have suggestions on how to make that more specific or to add a further element of prioritization, even around which of those processes you would focus on first, then we'd love to hear that. Okay, I'll focus on the carbon. Mm -hmm. As a farmer, um, I would like to see us reverting back to where we are feeding the soil, soil life. And also relating to carbon, I would like to see us adopt strategies to end this thing of we exporting beef, importing beef, exporting uh, pork, importing pork, and having all those food miles and, and all those produce meeting each other to in and out of the ports. So local, local produce and, and substitution of imports and as I say, feeding the soil and moving away from chemical agriculture. Perfect. Very, very, very good example set there in terms of concrete action. Okay, so we have this gentleman, this gentleman, Anya here. We'll go that way and I see you again. But let's give other people a chance to speak if they haven't so far. Yes, please. Hi. I'm Paul Dowding. I'm a retired scientist and a landowner. I have improved the hydrological property properties of my farm, improve the carbon fixation, improve the pollination. I have not received a single euro in subsidy, and yet I'm making money on the enterprise in, the sense, in many senses. So that's, that's one thing, that we need to target much more of the subsidies towards um, those measures at the top, hydrological processes, carbon fixation, and pollination. Second, I would support the previous um, questioner. At one stage, I was a soil microbiologist. I've taught soil biology for many years, and I think the one elephant in the room that is missing from all this the, is the soil. Mm -hmm. There is no European legislation to protect the soil. So we ought to be really putting pressure on Europe to produce a directive about soil. At the moment, rain is washing clay, which is the most valuable part of the soil, down the rivers, it's polluting the rivers, it's ending up in the sea. Yeah. And farming practices, plowing across contours, one of the reasons for this. Every time on my journey 
between Wicklow and Clonagall, I see erosion gullies. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't be happening. No. Okay, I'm going to say thank you so we can get other... That one action within this that you'll see is, a is the development and implementation of a national soil strategy. So look particularly at that action when you're looking at it online and see if you want to modify it, add to it, um, increase its ambition. That would be really fantastic. Um, yes, please. Hi, I'm Mike Brennan from the Eastern Midland Regional Assembly. Just in relation to um, all like hydrological processes, carbon pollination, is there any... Uh, disaggregation between rural and urban and do, does urban biodiversity and making space for nature in cities possibly through land management practices by local authorities have a place in this strategy or is that too fine a scale? It's not, there isn't a disaggregation right now between urban and rural specifically. I think your suggestion is a good one and then I think it's just, um, you know, what we've done within this with this plan is if something is already an action in the National Biodiversity Action Plan, we haven't repeated it. We have one big action in here, which is fund and implement the National Biodiversity Strategy. So if there's something in particular that's linked to resilience building, which obviously there is, it builds the resilience of our urban areas to have green areas and blue areas within them, then that could be an action. So I'd say, would you write that down and send it in to us? That's a good suggestion. Um, back down here, Anya. Thank you. Uh, Anya Murray is my name. And the, what would really need to be on this list is a, a strengthening of the Natura 2000 network. We've spent 30 years identifying and designating uh, special protection areas for birds um, and special areas of conservation in Ireland and right across Europe. And we've drawn a red line around all of these sites. And it, it's as though we've walked away and expected that by designating them, they will therefore be protected, which we all know is not the case. Uh, they are suffering from a, a, a lack of protection. There needs to be a whole pile more funding for our protected areas. There needs to be more facilitation within planning and local authorities. Uh, there needs to be funding for farmers who are operating. Most of our protected areas are privately owned, uh, and the, the, the funding for farmers to farm in a way that's consistent with achieving favorable conservation status of the species and habitats in those protected areas isn't being provided to any, any adequate level. So uh, there was also a review uh, two or three years ago by the European Commission of the success of the birds and habitats directives across Europe. It was a massive uh, undertaking and that the main conclusion there was that we, are, we aren't implementing the birds and habitats directives properly. So while we have these really good laws and we have this really excellent system of protected areas, um, we're not implementing the policy and the strategies that are there. So there needs to be a lot more attention in, in doing that, in strengthening our, our protected area network. Um, we, and then we also need to go further and put buffers around most of those areas. So when we're dealing with things like coastal squeeze uh, on coastal SPAs, we need to allow for those habitats to move landward uh, also in, in mountainous areas. So we need buffer zones. We need to e not expand the areas, but put buffer zones around yeah. them to make them more resilient. Um, and then on the third point there, the payment for ecosystem services through GLOSS, uh, I think that doesn't go nearly far enough. We need to overhaul uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 of the Common Agricultural Policy um, to incentivize climate change adaptation to, for, uh, and mitigation and biodiversity protection throughout the entire common agricultural policy. GLOSS is just one very small part of Pillar 2. Uh, we need to go a whole pile further. Uh, President Higgins said that this morning. He talked about he was questioning whether the funding that we're putting into agricultural subsidies is going far enough for, for biodiversity protection. I would say that it definitely isn't, and we need to be a lot more far-reaching than just looking at GLOSS. Great, thank you. Okay, can we swing up just quickly the Slido to see what other suggestions people have put in and then we're going to move on. So even your point there about connecting protected areas to the wider landscape, that for example is an action that we have within Objective 3 and connectivity. So some of these are, are captured but it's, it's great to see them. Um, so you can protect, so I think that one's around data, so that'll be in Objective 2 which is around collecting information. Kelp forests promote sustainable kelp. So try and write these as actions. The more you write them as an action, the more likely it's going to end up in the final document. So protect kelp forests. So 
And would that mean a specific action around a specific species, or would it be a, a, broader, a broader action? Think about that. Um, decouple production and stock, uh, develop carbon payments to keep peat and bog lands. Yes, that's a good one. Uh, decouple production and stocking levels. We can think, think about that. OK, so hold all this. All of this comes back to us. We include it within our consultation process. But I'd love to move on to the next action, because some of you are addressing objective two already. Objective two is to increase our understanding of the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. OK, so we can go to the second one there, please. And so, you know, John Call made a suggestion here. Action, do a comprehensive vulnerability assessment. Guys, can we go on to the next? Oh, I can do it myself. Uh, so understand climate impacts. Number one here is we absolutely need a comprehensive vulnerability assessment. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. Um, but there are other things that we can do about monitoring impacts and consequences. There are actions we could include around citizen science. And there's more we should be doing around scenario planning, learning from current extreme events and applying that to future expected um, extreme events. We have all the scenarios and the different models that we learned about yesterday from Paul Nolan that give us an insight into the future. Um, so in terms of, try and be specific to the objective, in terms of understanding climate impacts and biodiversity, are there specific actions that people would like to propose? Again, you can do it by Slido or you can stick up your hand. So I see you, John, but I want to see if there's someone I haven't heard from yet that would like to contribute. So this lady here, please. Hi, um, my name is Oriel and I'm an archaeologist based in Sligo and I have a business called Sea Trails. I'm also on the um, Heritage and Schools programme as a listed expert for Sligo in the Northwest. And I'm not sure if there's anyone here who's on the Heritage and Schools programme. There is? There's a few? Great. So over the last two days I've noticed that uh, Heritage and Schools hasn't been mentioned at all, at least in the, in the talks that I've been at. Um, so um, I think it's a fantastic resource for... Um, allowing very, very young, tiny little people, <laughs> age three, four, five, and six, and upwards in primary school level to learn about how important heritage is. They're the ones that are going to carry on in the future, and they're going to be the ones who are actually living in a far more, I suppose, um, impacted um, environment than we are. So I think the, the education is the most vital source um, uh, um, or thing that we can do now in, in order to protect the future. And the way that I'm doing it through my own business is I'm, I'm, I'm doing guided walking tours, showing them archeological sites, uh, the flora, the biodiversity, the landscape around us um, in beautiful areas in Sligo and Leitrim. And even um, the local people who come out on my walks are amazed at what's around them. And they may have been walking there for a long time and not actually realize, wow, I didn't realize certain uh, type of orchid grew in this area, for example. Um, so so I your think action is education? The, the action, absolutely, I think it has to be um, all around. And, and I'm hearing in the last two, two days in this conference that there's huge talk about agriculture and industry and the impacts of all of that. And it's guided towards the older generations. And the problem is that the education in biodiversity didn't exist um, uh, 30 years ago. Um, so what we're experiencing now is the result of that, um, because in schools and, and parts of curriculum, it wasn't necessarily there, even though you might have studied history and geography, okay. but you weren't really honing in on all of that. So I think that the key is to get in there with the young people and encourage those schemes that are teaching those tiny little people who are out there. And one little, just No, I'm going to stop you there, because you had enough time. OK, sorry, OK. As That's someone that, who yeah. got bumped That's... earlier because of not respecting time, I'm going to stick up that we get everybody an equitable chance to talk. So yes, sir, can we hear from you? Yeah. Um, sorry. Yes. Um, there's a few of us here from on Tashka, the education unit, Green yeah. Schools, LEAF, Clean Coast. And uh, the work the Heritage Apps do is amazing in schools. I think what we do is excellent in schools too, but actually I think ultimately this kind of stuff needs to be embedded in the curriculum and it's not at the moment. Um, yeah. I'll just give a quick anecdote about that. Uh, we took a group of young uh, trainee school teachers, they were all 21 very bright kids and I just gave them a quick straw poll. I said, you know, tell me about the native Irish trees, you know. This group of kids who got 480, 500 in their leaving cert were able to name uh, just three trees. You know. How can they transfer that knowledge you know, about nature, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, all that? 
they can't really. So. Okay. Yeah. So Embedded in education the on biodiversity and climate change in the curriculum. In a serious way. You know, yeah. the teachers feel that they, teachers actually don't have the confidence at the moment to, to get out there and do okay. stuff. Um, so. um, who else would like to contribute? I'm skipping over you because you spoke before, sorry, but I will come back to people again. So the gentleman here, um, right here. Oh, I don't know who I've missed. You've got your eye on somebody else. Um, thank you. Taiga Mahani, EPA. Um, just on the data and data gaps, and I think it's linked to monitoring the impacts. Uh, we have to have some baseline information before we can actually determine what the impacts are. And our water courses, our wetlands, our coastal areas really should be, I think, the priority areas to focus on wetlands in effect. If we could get all of those mapped once and for all, there's excellent data there already, but there are significant gaps and a commitment to do that within a time frame so that by the end of the implementation of this plan that we have complete map have it resourced we've had the, the ministers here over the last few days so we have the opportunity to put in a bill for what this might cost on a phased approach but do it on a river catchment basis because that's the natural boundary of the hydrological regime and just a suggestion if i could I know it's chapter six in the plan, and I haven't seen it in detail, it says implementation, it has the various aspects. Mm -hmm. I'd recommend that you have a separate companion document as implementation, which would be the basis for reporting on progress during implementation. A number of government departments have taken on board that approach, and it has worked quite well. And finally, it would be useful where you mentioned that there are other actions in other plans that are addressing specific key aspects that they be mapped so that you're acknowledging there are other plans in place. This objective is doing this, that, and the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, yeah, that's really helpful. Because all this, we have looked at the other sectoral plans because they're also in the process of being updated at the moment. I think that's something that before the final version of this, we need to do that mapping exercise. You're quite right. Yeah, and I... Um, I alluded to mention the fact that step six is about implementation, monitoring, evaluation, report, learning uh, as we go, because obviously everybody's learning about how to adapt. This is new right across the world. Um, so that action is, is in there and is critically important. Here are some of the key things that are coming through, some of your suggestions for objective two, extend the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan model to more targets, to more species and more processes, great idea. Uh, vulnerability planning, yeah, uh, planning and I think understanding. We have to understand what the vulnerability is of our species and our ecosystems. Survey the older generation, particularly farmers, and observe changes in land, plants, birds, and animals. I love this. Uh, this is essentially tapping into our traditional knowledge and our, the knowledge that we hold within us. And this knowledge is as important and as valuable as other sources of scientific information. Fun scientific research, absolutely. Um, no central funding, government funding for invasive species management to be used for, yeah, that's, these are great, these are really practical, thank you. Invest public awareness, increase public awareness of citizen science and citizen engagement. Those are really good. None of this gets lost, it all gets captured. Let's just keep going, because this is really helpful to, to us, and it's um, potentially easier than filling in the forms, although do fill in the forms as well. So the third, um, the third objective is around improving landscape connectivity to facilitate mobility in a changing climate. Okay, so some of the proposed actions that have uh, made it into the draft so far are understanding, like so actually better understanding, carrying out more research to understand how climate change affects habitat fragmentation. So we, as we know, there's lots of current causes of climate, of habitat fragmentation. Climate change comes in as another layer on top of that. What does that mean? Um, to better understand and perhaps to do more research on what is the role of connectivity and increasing connectivity. We had the example of the buffer zones, for example, around protected areas, what can we do with our hedgerows, how we manage our farmland to increase connectivity in order to increase resilience to climate change. So always within each of these actions, try and bring it back to climate change because that's the purpose uh, of this particular plan. Um, and to connect the areas, I say, protected areas to the landscape. Are there other suggestions? Yes, please. Right here, Bernadette. Um, he's coming behind you. Uh, yeah, Bernadette Connolly from Cork Environmental Forum. Um, one of the areas that's a little bit neglected, it was brought up there with the kelp, but is the whole marine area. So I think we mm. haven't designated marine protected areas and we need a necklace of them around our coast 
I mean, the marine spatial plan is out at the moment being compiled. Um, it, the focus of that, I think, has been very strongly towards, you know, renewable energy maybe off sea. So I think we really need to protect our marine landscape as well. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned here at all, and Ireland has signed up to it, is the European um, Landscape Convention. So landscape, and in the previous session, cultural links with our biodiversity has, is the strongest one from the research in TCD that they were doing. So I think we really need to protect that. And the kelp is a buffer for climate change. Mm. And just one last point, because the regional spatial plans are also out, and planning is a huge issue. But as it is, 40% of our um, inhabitants live within five kilometers of the coast. So the whole impact of climate change and on the coastal communities is, is a huge issue. So I think it's really important to protect what is there. Um, and I'm not too sure about how we protect ourselves there. I think we need to look at, um, I don't know if it's coming up, but planned retreat is never um, spoken much of. So I think that needs to happen to protect the biodiversity as well. That's yeah, thank you, Bernadette. Those are really important points. And you're right, we actually don't have an action in there around connectivity related specifically to marine. There are a number of places where the specific marine aspect is included, but that one isn't, so that's a really good pick up. Thank you. The lady behind um, Bernadette here. Actually, my comment um, fits nicely with Bernadette's comment because um, I wanted to raise the national landscape strategy. I was on the steering committee tell, for Tell us the, what your name is. Marianne Harris, uh, Dublin City Council. I was on the steering committee for the national landscape strategy. It took us eight years to get the government to publish it. It was published in 2015 under the European Landscape Convention because Ireland ratified it but didn't produce a strategy for years. So we did, but there's no implementation. So it's been published since 2015. We have been asking for funding and resources. It is sitting on the shelf. So I hope now that you're putting this in as action three, that your strategy doesn't suffer the same fate. <laughs> yeah, I think we could fill our strategy with like actions which are implement the previous strategies. Um, you know, it, 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 and that's a difficulty in this. We don't just want to repeat what's already there, but we do want to add another reason, another reason for, for investing and doing these things. We'll take the gentleman here and the gentleman behind, and then we'll move on to the next one, just so we, um, if people are interested in different parts of this, that they, everybody gets a chance to engage. Yeah. Thank um, you. Michael Hannan, um, retired park superintendent. I think if, when you're talking about connectivity, in the urban area in particular, one of the great ways to do it is along the river valleys. Now, unfortunately, in Dublin, most of those river valleys are already encroached on. But we need to think, if we're talking about flooding mm -hmm. and biodiversity protection or biodiversity enhancement or whatever, then we need to be talking on a very big scale. We need to be, if we're running parks along rivers, we need to be, in, in the development plans at the moment in the Dublin area, it's 10 metres you can build up as close to the rivers. The fisheries people, I think, are talking about 30 or 40 metres. There is no standardised plan, and we need to have a setback on river areas and urban areas up to 100 metres in places to allow for the flooding, to allow for biodiversity enhancement, to allow for connectivity all along, and then for people. Because the whole thing is people need to be involved, they need to see biodiversity, they need to connect with each other, and the river valleys are the way to do that. Thank you. That could also go into the, the rural areas as well, because there was a lot of talk about protecting rivers uh, and farms and stuff, and setback areas really need to be talked about in that context as well. Okay, great. That's really practical and helpful. And thank you, everybody. I can see all the actions rushing in here on the slide. That's really great. It's a really practical way for us to capture one of this. So the gentleman behind... Um, I can't see you now. Oh, there you are. Hi. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my name is Julian, so I'm based in IT Sligo. Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work on um, sort of landscape connectivity and how greenways can multifunction as ecological corridors, so maybe a bit of innovative ideas there. Um, I do think that we need more work uh, to be done, firstly to understand and identify and map our landscape ecosystem connectors, sort of in, a, in an all-Ireland context. So looking at Northern Ireland especially as well, because connectivity does not know borders in that sense. Um, and this needs to be done at various local, regional, and international scales. And secondly, or subsequently, we need to focus um, actions towards maintaining, perhaps more so than, than engineering, and managing these connectors. That's Perfect, thank you. 
Um, right, we're starting to get really low on time, so uh, I was aware that we might not get through all our objectives, but let's just have, move on from that, right? I know people have more to say. Let's just have three minutes on, stick your hand up. Do you want to do number, of, oh, we, I missed one. Look at that, number four is missing. Oh, there you go. We're not going to do number four. We're going to go straight to financing, okay? Um, four actually is all around societal engagement. I feel like we've had quite a lot of richness on that in the plenary sessions and some of the other sessions, so I'll, I'll dip into and draw from that. So three minutes on financing. What are your great ideas? Is it green bonds? Is it payment for ecosystem service? So is, is it some kind of eat out better structure for interdepartmental collaboration so that we have agriculture putting money aside for biodiversity, transport putting money aside for biodiversity, culture putting money aside for biodiversity. The, the budget of National Parks and Wildlife Service is not going to do it. Um, it is simply not going to be enough. What are, in addition to these things, any bright ideas? Because this is the heart of the matter. If we can't fund it, it won't get done. Yeah, right down the back. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Collins from the Forest Service. Um, and I can have an opportunity to, to respond very briefly to the other one as well because they're linked. We have this native woodland scheme. Um, it's been op in operation for over 18 years now, developed with National Parks Wildlife and Woodlands of Ireland, Inland Fisheries, Heritage Council, and there's huge track record in terms of developing new e uh, native woodland for ecological purposes. Um, and it's a fantastic way. It's a measure that's already there to link up rivers with upland habitats with existing native woodlands and provide that protective buffer. Um, and there's attractive grants that go with that. Um, and a couple of months ago, we also introduced an initiative to attract corporate funding to turbocharge the existing grant for the scheme to bring more landowners into it, um, specifically so that you can get corporations you know, reporting on, on ecosystem services, et cetera, and to co connect corporations and businesses, local or international, with uh, farmers who are developing this habitat type. So one thing I'd say is look at existing um, measures there already, like the Native Woodland Scheme, and see how we can use it uh, more strategically um, and in this way. Perfect. That's really good and really practical. Thank you so much, Kevin. Anybody else got a pot of money? <laughs> yes, please. Just in relation to a point that was mentioned about the kelp forest, mm -hmm. um, EPA has recently funded a project entitled Diversity and Resilience of Kelp Ecosystems in Ireland to the tune of a quarter of a million, and that's going on over three to five years. Significant amount of investment. Down the line, there's going to be outputs from that. Secondly, and the gentleman alongside me has mentioned it about alongside rivers and setbacks, it doesn't cost anything zoning green and blue corridors in every single land use plan. And each land use plan have a green and blue infrastructure strategy has to happen. I think this document could actually push, push what was just mentioned behind the National Landscape Strategy committed to producing a landscape character map for Ireland. Two years ago, the tender documents were produced and they're lying in a desk unissued. Now, that's an absolute disgrace. There are ill-informed decisions being made on wind farms and others. Having the landscape mapping will give us a holistic view from the soils to the rock to the vegetation to the communities, the people, the mountains, rivers, streams, and the shorelines. And it's an absolute disgrace. We have to have action on it, as we do on biodiversity. But I think we could leverage the funding from five or six departments five million euro to do, have that mapping, to do the landscape character assessments. When you look at that investment in, against the consequences of not having the information and in, in, informed decisions, I think it would be money well spent and well invested. Thank you, yeah. Certainly that bigger picture of what, of what we have and what our landscapes are made up of is really important. Right, I'm not going to take any more because we have five minutes. We don't want to be late for lunch or all the good sandwiches will be gone. <laughs> Critical if you're a vegetarian because uh, then you have to go hunting around all the tables to find them. Um, I'm going to hand back to, to Margaret for the last word. Just again to reiterate, this richness of suggestions that you've made 
through Slido is it, it all feeds back. We collect it up at the end of at the end of today. We'll also I'll also sit down with Rebecca to make sure that there's a, a core message. Um, the core message is from in general from this session feedback. And um, before you go, hang on, because I'm going to just put up here the link. So if you go onto the National Parks and Wildlife Services website or indeed the general website that Michael Ewing directed us all to. Um, www.gov.n.consultations you can, oh this is an old presentation and it's not there um, uh, but go on to www.nps.ie National Parks and Wildlife Service and you'll find it there it is open until the 17th of April so sometimes those long deadlines are dangerous because you'll forget about it, don't forget about it um, there'll be a press release about it and more noise about it in, in the next few days. But please do engage. You have already engaged. What you've said here today is directly going to feed into that. Um, Margaret, stand up and say thanks to everybody. Sure, if not, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone.